So Ruth Millington from Sheffield has sent in an extract from her memoir called Aftershock. It's the true story of how she survived the BAM earthquake in Iran on the 26th of December in 2003. Now, it's a fairly vivid account of what happened to her as she was trapped in a hotel after the earthquake. We're going to have the pleasure of speaking to Ruth to delve a little bit deeper into this just after we've heard it. But right now, this is Ruth Millington with Aftershock. The mass wailing begins at 5.27am, a a minute after the earthquake stops. It's slow and distant, constant and unrelenting, and comes from every corner of the city. Occasionally it's pierced by a scream, like a shooting star in the night. If I listen long enough, it starts to sound like humming. I know it's 5.27am, because it's the exact moment I look at my digital watch. The little light illuminates the black face covered in white dust. Other than the numbers, there's little else I can see in the darkness. I'm standing on a mound alongside M, my friend, trying to get a sense of it all. I'm wearing pink and white gingham cotton pyjama bottoms and a red t-shirt, and M is in a blue t-shirt and grey shorts, which provides little protection from the cold night air. My immediate urge is to start running again, but the ground's too even and unstable. I'd lacerate my feet, fall flat on my face. Instead, I look up towards the edge of the skyline, black mounds silhouette against the glistening night sky. I imagine for a moment city lights flickering on the horizon and hear the cries emanating from there, although it's got to be much closer. There's nothing beyond Bam but desert and mountains. Kaman, the closest city, is 125 miles away. It's all gone, M says. His voice sounds as empty as I feel. His shoulders are hunched over, face filled with disbelief. His lips are covered in dust, the life sucked out of them. His eyes may be bright and alert, but his lower lip is trembling. Despite the wailing, I feel abandoned and alone and overwhelmed by a sense of complete helplessness. All I can smell is the dust which swirls furiously in the air like a blizzard, choking my nose and throat, making my eyes water. I cough a lungful of it out. It rests in my hair like dandruff, settles on my face like powder and falls around my feet like fresh snow. It also illuminates the air, enough for me to see my immediate surroundings and the vague outline of objects beyond. There's a girder by my left foot, which disappears into a mound, and to my right, a large, upright, white PVC window frame, which balances precariously. By its side is a wooden door frame, which looks as though it's sinking into quicksand. Scattered everywhere are broken bricks, like the aftermath of a bomb explosion. As my eyes become more accustomed to the darkness and the glow of the dust, I scan the area beyond. I don't remember much of it, to be honest. I arrived last night after sundown, so I only have a vague idea of what the hotel looked like. From the roadside, you entered through a metal door in the wall. Displayed above was a big yellow sign with the words Akbar's Tourist Guest House. There was the main building to the right, Around the back were some single-storey rooms set around a courtyard covered with paving stones. I remember my boots catching in one. Then there were a couple of date palms at the far end with sturdy rough trunks and huge spiky leaves which spread out like a fan. I glanced towards the mound where once stood our room. It seems much further away than it actually is. Something black is sticking out of the top. The metal door still there and the glass intact, though I can't imagine how. It's still partially open, just as we left it. But now I can see what blocked M from opening it. Immediately in front of it are the fallen roots. They form the wall of rubble we climbed up. Slabs of plasterboard are strewn along its top. A wooden beam lies broken in pieces and what looks like a sheet of corrugated iron is undulating curves sticking out through the ground. I imagine for a second the roof's falling off, first quivering and jolting. Then they bounce and begin to slide like avalanches. I tell myself that we're lucky to be alive. Further afield, there are more large mounds and dark, odd-shaped objects sticking up in the air. I can't take any more though and have to look away. 
I want the hotel to still be standing. I want us to be tucked up in our beds, only a few hours away from our planned sunrise visit to the Argy Bam, the city's ancient citadel. We'd planned it for ages and were so excited. We'd wake up early, grab our bags and walk the 30 minutes to the site. Then we'd spend time taking photos and exploring before we'd head off to investigate the rest of BAM. Em and I turn to face each other. We watch each other's tears flow, followed by streams of red, raw skin appearing against our ashen cheeks. Ruth Millington there with an extract from her memoir, Aftershock. It's the true story of how she survived the BAM earthquake in Iran on the 26th of December 2003. And I'm delighted to say that she joins me now. Ruth, thank you so much for sharing that with us. How does it feel to share that on the BBC? Um, I'm absolutely delighted and honoured that you chose me. Um, So thank you for having me on the show and listening to my piece. And what as things to experience like I can't even imagine it and I don't need to because you painted the picture so well how was surviving that earthquake like can you even start to put together I'm sure like even all this time later 20 years later nearly it's still you can't believe it but can you just sort of take me back to that time and tell me what it was like well yeah I mean I'd arrived the night before in BAM um and I literally was a bit jet like went to bed and this earthquake struck at 5.30. It was pitch black and the whole building came in on us. And that extract there is literally, we fought our way out of the clapped building and were stood on top of a hotel, which is just completely destroyed. And we know that people are buried under the ground. And, you know, reflecting on it now, and as when I actually wrote the book as well, it was a a very traumatic time, but I kind of went into survival mode during that period to dig people out. We were digging people out for about, uh, it was a 30 hour rescue operation to get people, 12 people out out of the hotel, uh, seven of whom survived. And, you know, even when I talk about it now, and even though I've written a book about it, and this is an extract, it still is a very sort of traumatic thing to even talk about it now. And you, you are diagnosed with PTSD as well, aren't you? And I think, you know, it's so important when people have PTSD or other mental health conditions that they are open to talk about it. Of course, I'm not forcing you to at all, though, but can you, mm. you tell me a little bit about how maybe um, you, your writing has helped that? Has it been cathartic in any way? Has it relieved some of it or not really? Um, the, I think in the first year, I... Um, uh, suffered really intense post-traumatic stress disorder. I had a lot of anger, a lot of displacement. There's a whole range of emotions that you go through. And then a lot of that was suppressed. Um, and one of the storylines which you actually don't know about is that M, my friend who I'm travelling with, we fell out a few months after the earthquake and he's refused to speak to me ever since. Mm-hmm. And that compounded a lot of the issues of, of post-traumatic stress disorder because I was having to come to terms with my best friend no longer speaking to me being very angry and still is with me Um, and that's to me that is one of the symptoms of grief and post-traumatic stress disorder and for years I kind of buried this and but when I came to write the book um, I had to approach that storyline and uh, let me tell you writing the earthquake story was horrific Mm because there are some really horrific scenes in it but for me the story about M and losing his friendship kind of pushed me over the edge a bit uh, but by writing it, it's kind of, I've got over that post-traumatic stress disorder now because I did a lot of self-analysis and self-exploration to kind of look within myself and, and, and explore those feelings, which is really important when you've got post-traumatic stress disorder. And what was it that sort of made you put pen to paper? What did you want people to sort of take from it? Or what did you think that you would get from writing your story down? I think there's a number of things. Um, I think this is a very important story for Iran. It's a very misunderstood country, even though at the moment there's a lot of you know, things being written in the newspapers about it and press. But a lot of people do not fundamentally understand Iran and the Iranians, so I wanted to get their story across. But also as well as, as a woman, um, 
we're often not portrayed as brave in the traditional sense of the word. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of taboo around that. And we're often pigeonholed as just being brave in circumstances where, for example, women can be brave if they ch ch you know, save children, they, their child. They can be brave if they're a carer or in the medical profession, or they can be brave if they're a victim. But there's very few stories around where they you know, portray women in the traditional sense of the word, roles which are usually associated with men. So I wanted to really bring that out and examine that in my memoir as well and talk about it and show that in situations where we are pushed to extremes, the really, the really dark, destructive side of nature, we talk a lot about, you know, the soft side of nature. There's a very dark side to nature. And when as a woman you're put in that situation and you know there's 12 people that are going to die within minutes or a maximum an hour below you, you have to get on with the job. And, and this concept of, uh, and these stereotypes of bravery just fall away. So I really wanted to examine that. Do you know what, Ruth, even just listening to you talk the way you just have has made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I don't know how you made it through that and with with such bravery. And you're so right in what you just said. They're like, women are brave if they're victims, but not if they actually do something that might be seen as a manly thing to do. Like, my God, you stepped up in that situation when other people might have crumbled. So it's just, it's incredible. And it's so nice to have you on the show and, and discuss this. And what I really want want to get in as well before I let you go is you're adapting this into a screenplay that's one see I'm clapping for you there Ruth Thank and you. you've been nominated for an award as well spill the beans please yeah well a couple of awards first I, 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 as a result of this I did get three bravery awards uh, which I haven't spoken about but today as well as I've just heard uh, well, the memoir itself has won about four writing awards but today as well as I heard that I've just been uh, shortlisted for brunch new travel writer of the year so I'm very wow. pleased about that. I'm so impressed with you. That's so brilliant. And with the, the screenplay then, so is that something that people will be able to go and see or how are you navigating that? Well, I'm writing it at the moment right. um, and I'm also looking for a publisher for the book. So I'm looking for both avenues to get the book published and also write the screenplay. So I'm probably looking at possibly a television drama, a three-part television drama. Maybe the BBC will be interested. <laughs> Maybe they um, will be. Well, how can I get in touch with you? Have you got social media, an email? Yes, I'm on social media. So if anyone wants to get in touch or are interested in the story, whether it's publishers or agents or whatever, do get in touch. And I'm more than happy to speak with them and you, you can find me on Twitter at Ruth Millington 1 um, and if you just type in Ruth Millington into um, the um, in, into your Google searches um, I've got a website there I have a, um, um, a holiday podcast, it's called Extreme Holidays Podcast about extreme travel stories, um, I'm the host of it so there's a whole different array that you can get in touch or contact the BBC as well because they I mean, will have my details If there was somebody to host a podcast in that genre I think <laughs> For it. Ruth, thank you so much for coming on the show. Please upload to us again and have a fantastic Friday night. Thank you, and you too.